Hello there, Pastor Josh Shelton here at Redemption Church. I just want to take a second and say thank you for watching this sermon recording. I truly hope and pray that it is an encouragement to you. And if it is, would you please consider giving to Redemption Church? You can do that by going to our website, redemptiongillette.com. Again, I just pray that this is a blessing and an encouragement to you. Thank you for watching. We're continuing on in the book of Acts. We're in chapter 6 this week. Just a little snippet of chapter 6. Verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty." But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, good morning. How are we doing today? Wow. I had somebody answer this morning, probably, a, I would think, a pretty common and uh, Consistent answer to that question. Good, tired. Just like that. That's how I feel today. Good, tired. <laughs> so uh, maybe you can relate to that as well with those little chuckles. Hey, before we get going too far here, I got I to gotta pull up my thing here. But let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Josh. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, it doesn't sound very in welcoming if I'm not actually making eye contact while I'm saying this. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I would love the opportunity to meet you. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we are going to have, we already have had a good day together worshiping, but we get to a chance, an opportunity now to go into God's Word. But before we do that, as per tradition, uh, kids, uh, it is family worship, and I have some bad dad jokes for you. And... Um, as I've said before, my criteria for picking these bad dad jokes are not Quentin's. If it makes Quentin laugh, I don't want it. But if, but if it makes me laugh, then, then, then I'll share it. Now, if it doesn't, there was one this morning I shared with the group up here, and that I thought was hilarious. It's a little too dry for some kids, probably. It probably would go over their heads. But here's a couple jokes um, to get us uh, going this morning. Here's the first one, okay? Air used to be free at the gas station. Now it's $1.50. You know why? Inflation. I like that one. So what do you call a shoe made of a banana? A slipper. Okay, all right. Here's probably the best one. I, I really got a chuckle out of this one. Take it or leave it, groan if you will. So my dog used to chase people on a scooter a lot. It got so bad, we had to take his scooter away. <laughs> all right, all right, that's enough. Enough of that. Hey, before we, before we go any further, let me just draw your attention to a couple things. Um, so we have these Connect cards. There's a quarter sheet of, on the back table there. Uh, if you're new with us, if you just take a second and fill out that Connect card, and you can hand it to me, or you can hand it to Cindy, or Quentin, or Tim at the end, and uh, you can put it in the black boxes as well, and that's a way for us to get that. But that's just a way for us to follow up with you and get to know you a little bit better, and we have just a gift to say thank you for joining us this morning. Also, uh, if you didn't get a bulletin on your way in, there's some extras on the back table, and if you need a Bible, or you want a Bible, or you know somebody that needs a Bible, please, please let us know. We would love to get you... Uh, uh, access to God's word, and so we would, we'd love to get you a Bible. 
But this morning, we're continuing in this book of Acts. We kind of hit pause for a while through Advent and, and th- going through the book of Titus and a couple different things. But now we're back in Acts, and it is great. This is our third week back in Acts, and I've, I'm just loving it. Um, this is a, such an amazing book. And so today, we're going to be talking about the human limitations in the church and how we can share ministry in order to grow. But before we do that, let's just, let's just catch our breath. Let's pause, take a deep breath, and let's just go to the Lord in prayer and ask that he would speak to us this morning. God, we just come to you now, and we just pray that you would please help us as we, as we open up your word, as we seek to understand what you're saying and, and what, how it applies to our lives. God, I pray that just through all of the, through all the squirming and th- the kiddos and all the different things that are going on this morning, that you would penetrate our hearts and our minds and help us to understand and to grow today through your word, through your love, and through our, the, our, just the gathering together. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we do pray. Amen. So this morning, uh, Cindy just read it for us. We're going to be in Acts chapter 6. So go ahead and open up your Bibles if you aren't already turned there to Acts chapter 6, the first seven verses. So this section is often seen as the introduction, introduction of deacons into the church. And there's, I think, good reason for that, as we'll see. But we also we should see that this position was bred out of a, 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 a controversy in the early church. And so that's really what we get to. The very first thing in 6.1, we see this, this controversy emerge. But before, we see some good things happening. So as I was studying this this week, a lot of different commentators referred to this section as growing pains. I thought it was really interesting. I, it was not just one commentator, several commentators. I counted three commentators that actually referred to this section or titled this section Growing Pains which I think is actually a very fitting description of what is happening in the early church. Because the Acts church is a magnificent picture of faithfulness and unity, but we got to be careful because it's not perfect, right? It's not perfect, and we we see some, some chinks in the armor throughout the book of Acts. For example, Ananias and Sapphira, that happened in the church. But we also see something here that's happening in the church. And so, so far, just to give you a really, really quick review of Acts, we have seen great persecution already take place on the account of the gospel, and that will continue and increase. It's about to get worse. But we also see that God is continuing to increase their numbers as well. He continues to increase their, their number, numbers of people that are following. And it's like a, it's like a, I thought of it like a freight train. That's running. I, I, I had this happen to me the other day. I just thought of this analogy just now, so apologize if it's not a good one. But you know when you're on the interstate and you pass a semi, right? This happened to me the other day. You pass a semi, but then you start, you pass them at the, maybe climbing up the hill or at the top of the hill, and then you get past them. What happens? With the weight of that truck, they start going faster on the back side of the hill, don't they? they all of a sudden, they're closer to you, and maybe, maybe you are, you're, you're, kind of jockeying for position there on the highway or interstate, only simply because they have more weight. They are. It's kind of like that in the sense that there's nothing stopping that. What God is doing in the increase in numbers, how God is growing his church, God's going to do what God is going to do. God is going to grow his church and increase his numbers as he sees fit. It can't be stopped. But we, we also see this controversy. And no matter the controversy, no matter the sin, God... God increases. God brings the growth. And there's a new type of controversy that emerges here in chapter 6. We've already seen it happen inside the church, Ananias and Sapphira, as I just mentioned. But here, it isn't about sin, right? Because Ananias and Sapphira, was about, it was about sin in their own hearts, and their own minds, how they had, had con- conspired together to, to deceive the Holy Spirit, right? But here, we actually see that the issue is human limitation, this is the, the controversy that instituted the position called deacon that we still use today. So what is that controversy? Right there in verse 1, it mentions Hellenists. Well, Hellenists are Greek. They were Greek-speaking Jews that, d- during the dispersion, the diaspora. So as all of the different Jews got spread out all over the region, all over the known world, there's Jews all over the place. But here, here they're actually Greek-speaking, not, not, they don't speak uh, Aramaic. 
And so now they are converted to Christianity and they're Hellenist Christians, they're Greek-speaking Christians. So it's a cultural thing, but it's mainly a language thing, a language barrier that we see here. And it says that they are disciples, a part of the church, not, not Gentiles, but Hellenistic Christians, if we understand the term. So what this means is that they aren't originally from Jerusalem, or at least they probably aren't, maybe their ancestors are. They're not from Jerusalem. And for one reason or another, these widows have come into Jerusalem. And guess what? Widows can be really, really vulnerable in that society, in that culture, and even in our own, right? I mean, there, there's some vulnerabilities there that nobody else really experiences. And, and in Jewish culture and in the, the early church, they really relied heavily on the church to take care of their widows. But what's happening here is they are, these widows, these Hellenistic widows are getting neglected because, because they are being overlooked is what it says. They're being neglected in the, the daily distribution. And that neglected, that word, if you, if you look at that in other translations, or if you look at that in the Greek, it can mean overlooked. And I think that that's probably a more accurate meaning, true meaning to the word, overlooked. So this isn't the apostles um, maybe showing prejudice towards the, the Hellenists or towards widows or towards, it's, it's they are being overlooked. They're, they're simply too busy. They're simply busy. The dilemma wasn't because they were, that, that they were second class citizens. It wasn't that they had a different skin color or ethnicity. It wasn't intentional at all. It, was based upon pre, it wasn't based upon prejudice. So these widows were not yet receiving the same care and provision because the apostles were busy doing something. What were they, what, what were they busy doing? Were they sitting on, their, sitting on their hands? Were they twiddling their thumbs? Were they enjoying really good food and trying to stay away from people? What were they doing? Well, it also mentions here this daily distribution, and we don't need to get too bogged down in that because really, it, more than just a specific meal or a specific meeting or gathering, it, what's happening is, is they are any physical needs, material needs that the people have in the church, they're being met by the church. So, uh, for example, if somebody is, is needing food or if their widow is needing some provisions, they're meeting those needs. And or, originally what happened is, is the people would bring their tithes and their offerings to the apostles and the apostles would uh, distribute it as, as, as needed. Well, it got to a point where this was no longer an efficient means of caring for the people. Because as they continue to grow, at this point, it could be 15, 20,000 people at the church in Jerusalem. We're talking about a lot of people here. And you see that growth really, really early on in Acts. It's a lot of people. So at some point, that system is going to have some breakdowns, right? It's going to have some breakdowns, and that's what we see here. In this next section, we see that they, the, 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 the solution to that, the sharing ministry in verses 2 through 6. So as this complaint is received, the, the, the apostles receive this complaint along with the full number of disciples that gather together. I think this is inc really incredible because if you've ever had somebody confront you about something, you have a choice to make in that moment, don't you? You can choose to receive it, you can choose to fight it, or you can choose to ignore it. And they, what, you know what they did? They stepped and they said, you know what, you're right. These widows are being neglected and we need to do something about it. We need to make a plan. We need to get something done. They didn't make excuses. They didn't pass the blame. They made a plan. So as we study this text, one word in particular is very, very important. Um, it's a Greek word, okay? Um, and I'm not going to spell it for you. I'm going to try to say, say it without butchering it, but it's diakonos. Diakonos. And what that means, it literally means servant or deacon. Okay? And, and that's where we get the word deacon from. But what's interesting is that word isn't found anywhere in this passage. <laughs> She's like, wait a second. That, that word isn't found anywhere in this passage, which is why some people do not believe that this is the institution of deacons in the church. However, I believe that this was the establishment of deacons primarily because of the related word that we see here in verse 2. There's another uh, um, version of the word in verses 1 and 4, but here in verse 2, we see this word diakoneo. 
Diokoneo, and you know what that word means? It means to serve. We see it at the end of it, it says to serve tables, to serve. But what's interesting, I'm going to get a little bit nerdy here for, for a moment. Okay, what's really interesting is that in Greek parsing, this is a present infinitive active verb. Okay, so what that means is that an infinitive verb, as I understand it, is kind of operates like a noun. So this is basically saying that all of the, the different verb, a collection of verbs, are made up into this infinitive verb. So to serve really means service in the church. It's, it's, it's a collective na- verb for all the different ways to serve within the church. So it's, it's not one specific task. So the statement is made by the apostles that they shouldn't serve tables. They shouldn't do these service projects in the church. But why? Why? What was the statement that they're making? What did the apostles need to focus their attention on? It says that it is not right that we give up preaching the word. That would imply that the apostles' focus should be on preaching the word. I'm preaching the word. This doesn't mean that the apostles were too superior for such projects or that they never served at all. That's not what it's saying at all. Rather, this is a statement about trying to do too much. The apostles were called to preach, and with this increased burden, they were forced to make a choice. They were forced to decide, okay, are we going to continue to preach God's word as we've been called to do, as as we've been commissioned to do by Jesus himself, or... Are we going to take care of and serve in these physical needs? The needs need to be met. Nobody's arguing against that, right? The needs need to be met, but they're having to choose here. And the preaching of the word was their first and primary calling. And there are several instances in scripture that speak to the concept of trying to do too much in our own strength. Two of them just right off the top of my mind come uh, about Moses. Moses, in his life, if you recall, um, they they've get to the wilderness. They've, they've come out of Exodus in, in Egypt. And the people of Israel are coming um, to Moses to rule on every matter in dispute. And it's, and it's a, a great burden. It's overburdening to Moses. And he's leading the people, and he's, he's just weighed down. He's getting burnt out. And his father-in-law comes up to him, Jethro. And you know what he says? His father-in-law says, hey, you need, to, you need to get some other people here to help you in these judicial responsibilities. You need to get somebody here that can help share this load and share this burden. And Moses listens, and it, it enlightens his burden. And in Numbers 11, we see Moses, he's advised by God himself to, to select 70 elders for a similar purpose, to, to share the load, to share the burden. And both of these highlight the importance of sharing ministry. Sharing ministry, I keep on saying that, that uh, if you don't know what that means, sharing ministry means that you are delegating responsibility and projects uh, uh, away to others. And it's not motivated by laziness. It's not like, oh, I'll have you do that because I don't really want to do that. Man, this, this lazy boy is feeling pretty good. I like, to, I like to be reclined. I like to, you know, have football on. I'll let somebody... No, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not motivated by laziness. It's not motivated by pride either. Oh, that's, that's beneath me. I don't, I don't do that. It's not motivated by pride, but rather from a heart to better serve the people and not overburden any one person. Because the reality is, is that ministry is a heavy task. Soul care is a heavy thing. It's a heavy thing. The apostles were devoted to preaching the word as they should have been. And there there were capable people to step up, to develop their gifting and serve in the church, all while sharing the burden of ministry and lightening the load for the apostles. And then in verse 3, it says this word, therefore. Now, just just a, a quick little tangent. If you ever are reading your Bible and you come to the word, therefore, stop, and you have to make sure you grasp what the therefore is referring to. You have to read around the passage that you're actually studying and get the context because if you're saying therefore, it's saying because of this and then continue on, right? And so you got to understand. So Luke is retelling this story of the apostles hashing out a plan to resolve this conflict within the church. And so what is the the apostles' plan to resolve this issue, the neglecting of the widows? His plan is to raise up servants to minister to the people. 
these servants, these deacons. It's, it's this office in the church that is further established in Paul's writings. And plain and simple, deacons are to, be, uh, to set an example of service in the church. Okay? The apostles' plan is for the whole congregation to select seven men to serve. Now, when I was reading this, I was like, why in the world seven? That's such a random number. Like, it's, like yeah, it comes up in Scripture. It's a biblical number, but why seven, right? And the truth is, is that we don't really know, I mean, why seven. There's no really, no theological reason for it. But one theory is that Jewish courts at the time and in history, they would commonly have seven members in, on the court, so this would have been a natural number for the apostles to suggest, the, 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 the apostles that used to be Jews, right? It would have been a really natural thing for them to suggest. Hey, let's have seven. But nevertheless, these seven men will then be appointed and commissioned by the apostles and will begin to minister to people, especially the Hellenist widows. So the church as a whole, the full number of disciples were to make these Selections. And Luke also gives us insight into what the qualities were of these seven men, what, what, what these qualities were supposed to be. Based on the names given here, it gives us all the different names. Uh, there, there's something about those names that actually tells us something. They're Greek names. They're Greek names, which actually makes sense. That's not by accident, because these were probably seven men that spoke Greek. Okay. If the, if the issue is that you have these Greek-speaking widows, maybe there's a, a language barrier, maybe there's a cultural barrier there, and so the seven men that are picked are picked so they can, can minister to that need specifically. It's not by accident. And those selected must also be of good repute, full of, spirit and, of, of the spirit and wisdom, it says. In order to qualify, these men had to be a visible figure of high character meaning they had, they had to have high character, but also, this is important, they also had to already be serving, visible. They, they had already be happening. The church had to know in their selection process who to narrow down. There's probably more than seven people in the church, seven, seven men in the church. So they, they, they were narrowing down based upon people that were already demonstrating these qualities, already serving in the church. These candidates, instead of looking to receive, would search for ways to give their lives to the church. And by the way, any church, any church would benefit um, from this type of service mindset. Consider how service, this, this service mindset could, could affect our church and, and how we view and interact with our church. Okay, It's not about the type of job in the church or the level of influence. Some jobs are, are pretty boring in the church. Some jobs are pretty dirty. In the church. Doing administrative work, by the way, I, I do way more administrative work than I did a year and a half ago, and I don't enjoy it. But doing administrative work, some people are like, yeah, this is great. And other people are like, oh, not that again. Um, but it's essential in the church function, right? It's, it's essential. Cleaning bathrooms isn't pretty, but it's essential. By the way, this portable baptistry that we have, somebody has to tear that down and set that back up, which, by the way, is not easy to do by yourself. But it's essential. It's, it's necessary. Doing dishes, shoveling the walk, cleaning up after the service, or cleaning up after a fellowship time. Serving in children's ministry or in other crucial areas of the church. These are all essential for life together as God's people. But my point isn't that you have to serve in one of these areas. My question is, is are, you, are you willing to? Are you willing to? In order to be a deacon at Redemption Church, that is where it starts. You know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You are an active member of the church, a person of high character. You are already serving and giving freely. And you desire to serve those around you in a greater capacity. You have a heart of service, a gift of serving. You, you desire to, to serve others. This is such an important role in the church. And in verse 4, we come back to the apostles and we see that the importance of this pastor-elder role within the church too. Because it says, it, it, it kind of clarifies that they're, they're to focus on preaching and it adds that they are to focus on and prioritize prayer in their lives. See, the highest priority for church leaders, elders, and pastors is to preach and to pray. 
The word used for preaching here is actually diakonia. It comes from that same word. I said it was in verse 1 and, and here in verse 4. And it means to serve up the word. Isn't that interesting? So if you're like, oh man, these pastors, are, they're, 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 they're high and mighty. They think that they don't need to do any serving. That's not the heart at all. In fact, ser- preaching the word is serving up the word. In a different in a different context, it's, it's serving as well in a different capacity. And so the, the apostles aren't throwing a shade on the deacons and other servants in the church. On the contrary, they are explaining that they can return. They are, they, are, they are setting this up so that they can return to their calling. They can return to what God has called them to do and to serve faithfully in it. And by the way, this is not an easy thing to do as a leader. If you have ever led anything in your life and you've led people that are, are doing stuff around you, that you're actually leading a team, it's not easy to do. It's really, really hard to, to have other people do stuff and you be responsible for it. It's really hard. Leadership is hard. Leadership development is hard. But it's a sign of good leadership to prioritize and to delegate that which others can do. It's a sign of good leadership. And here's why, because it, it prioritizes the calling that God has placed in your life. It is, it's, it's humbling because you're, you're literally admitting, I can't do it all. So it's humbling, but also it gives others the opportunity to, to grow as well. So the apostles, they had a specific calling. If you, if you go back to, to, to Acts chapter 5 at the very end, verse 42, we see their devotion to their calling here. And every day... In the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. This is why the burden of serving tables proved to be too much, because they were preaching constantly. They were going into people's homes and and serving, doing visitation, and preaching and teaching God's word. They needed to return to their calling to preach and let others step up and serve. So the apostles were to devote themselves to prayer it says as well. And we don't, I don't want us to skip over that. That's an important key component of, of leadership, especially church leadership, especially Christian leadership. You'd be hard-pressed to find the discipline of God's grace that is more essential to the health and the future of a Christian leader than prayer. And yet, if you polled them, you would likely find that it is the most neglected discipline Leaders, and especially Christian leaders, church leaders, must be grounded in prayer. And though, he's a, the, though Luke is addressing apostles specifically here, all believers can grow in the depth and the frequency of their prayer with the Lord. Every day, every day should start with prayer. You want to know why? Because it orients our heart, it reorients our heart on our all-sufficient Savior. Every day should should start with prayer because it sets the tone for the day. It sets the tone for our hearts and our lives and our walk with the Lord. And then we come to verses 5 and 6 as we continue on. And we see this process of these men being selected and appointed. They chose Stephen and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas. And there honestly isn't much known about these men um, except for Stephen and and Philip, which we'll get to here in the, the next few chapters of Acts. And by the way, Stephen and Philip very clearly were uh, evangelists as well. Um, so their, their, their service isn't limited to just within the church. Um, they actually were evangelists as well. And we see, excuse me, we see these seven, they're selected and set before the apostles. And the apostles do what they set out to do. They, they pray over them and they, essentially they commission them. They lay their hands on them and they pray over them. Now, praying on the hands, that, 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 that's a, a tradition, a practice that happened in the early church. We still do it today. We, we pray over uh, when we are um, commissioning people or we do healing prayer over people. We still do prayer today and, and laying on of hands, but, that's, but it's, there's nothing magic in laying on of hands. Okay, there's nothing magic or supernatural that's happening there. It happens in conjunction with prayer that is aligned with God's word. Okay, so we do do that. But this prayer and commissioning, they're taking place. And after this commissioning by the apostles, these men are able to con- continue serving and caring for the church. Notice what I said. They're continuing to serve and care 
maybe into a greater depth or a greater capacity, but continuing initially towards those Hellenist widows. And they're gonna share the ministry and thereby share the burden with other qualified and faithful believers. And if you think about this, this is kind of a major restructuring in the early church, major kind of restructuring of the, the leadership. And, and so the question I, I thought of was, is, is this restructuring going to negatively impact the development, the growth of the church? Well, remember what we said before. Remember what we said before, God brings the growth. And so we actually get the result of what, what came out of this restructuring in verse 7. It's opportunity for growth. And so after such controversy, in, in verse 7, Luke is eager to show that this sharing of ministry did not reduce the evangelistic fervor of the church. In fact, the numbers continued to increase. The disciples multiplied. That's a really crucial detail, by the way. Don't miss that. Underline that in your Bibles, that these are called disciples. They're called disciples, true believers who had received the Holy Spirit. You think about back to Jesus' earthly ministry, right? And how many people came and, and, and wanted to see Jesus uh, and wanted to, to witness what Jesus was doing, almost like somebody just going and watching a, a car wreck, right? They, they were there for the entertainment factor, or they were there because they wanted healed themselves. Many came selfishly, blinded by their own greed and need, but these people were legit, and God was grow, growing their numbers. God was blessing the church, even to the point where these Jewish priests, I love this detail that Luke gives us, these Jewish priests even became obedient to the faith in Jesus. What incredible testimony of transformation. It's estimated that there were about 8,000 priests at this time in Jerusalem in the first century, and obviously not all of them were part of this conversion, but these converted priests would have caused a great uproar among the people. And it would have caused a greater division between Jews and Christians. This is also, it might explain the, kind of the, the, the viciousness of the attack that we're about to see against the deacon Stephen here shortly. But, but as we come to verse 7 and we get to the end of that, it kind of brings us to a stopping point this morning. And in this short passage, we see an incredible example of how to resolve human limitation because we all have limitations, human limitation in the church. The, the, see, the, the church identifies the problem, they map out a plan to solve it, they solve it, and all the while they continue to preach the gospel, and as a result, more people are converted. More people come to know the Lord. And I, I think we should be encouraged by this. Uh, there's two things that we know about churches, okay? Two things that we know about churches. One, there's a lot of things we know about churches, but for the sake of discussion this morning, two things. We know that the churches will have problems. They will have problems because a church isn't a building. A church is a body of people. It's a gathering of people that have their own flaws and have their own sin and are, and are, and are messy. People are messy, that's, a, that's not a very well-known kept secret, right? People are messy. So churches are going to have problems. It's bound to be rife with issues, but we also know that growth is possible. In fact, if you look back in church history, controversy served as a catalyst for growth in the church. And the best part is that God brings the growth. And that is exactly what we see here in the book of Acts. And so as we close this morning, join me in praying uh, for our church that we would effectively care for the needs of the people all the while proclaiming God's word. And so, uh, by the way, when, we say, when I say that, we see that here, but we need both. We need both. We need to meet the physical needs of the people. Jesus talks about that, right? Like if, you, if here you are, you're, you're, you're sharing the gospel with people and you're quoting the Bible all the time to people, but you're not actually making an effort to meet physical needs. It's not going to land, right? It's not going to land. You need both uh, things. They need to be true of the church to fully represent the love and the care of Christ. And so here's how I want us to close. We're almost done. I want us to close with a couple practical uh, principles to take away from this passage this morning that will help us to grow. The first one is that we need to have uh, realistic expectations of one another and of our leaders. 
We are not perfect. You are not perfect. I am not perfect. Rather, we are sinners in need of God's grace. And that means that we need to, uh, we need to have our expectation, expectations of each other seasoned with grace. Seasoned with grace. We should be patient and charitable with each other. We should be quick to apologize and quick to forgive. So keep your expectations of each other. Keep your expectations of your leaders. Keep your expectations of God in the right frame, okay? Second thing is this. We, we need to say thank you to those who serve and look for opportunities to serve as well. Be aware of the different roles and ministries and be appreciative of how much planning and work it takes to serve the church. Be, be grateful for the people that, that faithfully serve each and every week how much planning it goes into that, and look for a chance to serve with the gifts that God has given you as well. You may not know what it goes into a Sunday morning logistically, but if you volunteer for um, hospitality or tech or children's ministry, I promise you, you'll find out. You'll get, you'll get a glimpse of what that, what that looks like and what it takes to, 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 to do that. Be thankful and consider where you can get involved. And here's the last one. Here's the last one. We need to share ministry. One of the greatest metrics I have found for spiritual growth, both individually and in the church, is discipleship. Here's what I mean by that. Discipleship is an opportunity for us to be vulnerable with other people. So don't be afraid to let someone into your world. And, and that, by the way, if you, when you let somebody in, that helps you grow, it helps them grow simultaneously. But not only that, the, the willingness to delegate and to share ministry is the mark of a spiritually mature person because we can't do it alone. So here's the question I want you to ask yourself, and we'll close on this note. I want you to ask this question. You can ask this of your own life, your own job. You can ask this of, the, of your, your secular job. You can ask this of ministry. I want you to ask this. Who can do what you do? I think, wow, that's a, that's a pretty simple question, Josh but it's actually a lot deeper than you think it is. Who can do what you do? Because in order to answer that question, you need to know three things. In order to answer that question, you need to know what it is you're supposed to do. You actually need to know your role. Your role as a father, your role as a, a mother, your role as a teacher, your role as a, whatever it is. Your grandparent, your role as, a, as, a, as an employee. You need to know what your role is, okay? The second thing is, is you actually have to be able to do that. You have to be able to do that to the point where you actually can, can actually show somebody else how to do what you do. Because it doesn't do any good for you to have a position and then not be able to show somebody else how to do it. If you need to learn how to do it better, if you need to have some more training, if you need to just pray that the Lord would give you the gifting and the strength and the endurance to do what he's called you to do, but you need, to, you need to know what you're supposed to do and you need to be able to do what you're supposed to do. And the third thing is, is you need to give it away. You actually need to give other people an opportunity to, to do what you do. And that's the hardest, that's the hard one for me. That's the hard one for me. But you have to let others share that role. And so against that measuring tool, we can see where we need to grow Right? Because if you're like, wow, I, I, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I am not doing it. Or if you're like, I know what I'm supposed to do, and I am doing it, but I'm not letting anybody else do it too. Right? It helps us to know where we are, but it also helps other people grow. It, it's, a, it's a discipleship process. It's the, both, uh, both of which, uh, us doing that and helping others and sharing ministry are vital to the growth of God's church. And so let's be about sharing ministry here at Redemption Church, okay? All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pray for us and then we're going to uh, take communion as the kids are getting some a little squirrely. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for loving us. We are so grateful for your word. God, as we, as we, as we go into your word today, we know that you have truth there for us. And it's not just there for us once a week. It's not just there for us when we, we think we need it or we realize we need it. It's there for us all the time. You're, you, you, you are so loving and kind to us to reveal yourself to us through your word. Help us today to grow, Lord. Help us to be willing to evaluate and humble ourselves and evaluate our, who can do what we do. 
Are we, are we doing what we're called to do? Or are we doing what we're supposed to do? Do we need to prioritize some things so we return to the calling you put on our lives? And do we, do we need to actually maybe learn and grow and develop to be able to do what we do so that others can learn how to do it as well? And God, I pray for the people here, people listening that don't know you as Lord and Savior. God, I, I think of, of Stephen and Philip, how they had this evangelistic heart and, and it was more, the, the, their service went beyond the church walls. It went beyond just the, the, the context of that. They, the God, that they had a heart's desire to share your word, share your gospel, and to see people's lives changed by it. And so God, that is our heart as well. And I pray that anybody that is listening this morning that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, God, that you would please penetrate their hearts. Please, please enter their hearts. Please draw them in and please do a work in, in, in their hearts that only you can do. I pray that you would save them this morning. God, I pray that we can rejoice in that together as a body of believers. Help us to grow. Help us to share ministry. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.